Welcome to our morning service today, the first Sunday of Advent, and a special welcome to you if you're joining us on our live stream, either at the moment while we are here or at some time during the week. You're very welcome. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. So today we light the first candle of our Advent wreath. Light and peace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is the first Sunday of Advent in which we recall the hope we have in Christ. God told Abraham that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed because he trusted and put his hope in God. The Old Testament spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a savior would be born a king in the line of King David. He would rule the world wisely and bless all the nations. We too believe in God's promise to send Jesus again to this world to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And I invite Muriel to come and light the first candle. Hope is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus Christ. A prophetic verse from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The fulfillment of the prophecy, a verse from Matthew chapter 24. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Let us pray. God of Abraham and Sarah and all the patriarchs of old, you are our Father too. Your love is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of David. Help us in preparing to celebrate his birth, to make our hearts ready and to place our hope in you. Help us today and every day to worship you to hear your word and do your will by sharing your hope with others. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Thank you. 
now we stand to sing the first verse of the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And straight after that, we will carry on singing, My Lord, He is a coming soon. for our time of confession. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we say together the thanksgiving prayer. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble and hearty thanks 
for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all humankind. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be sincerely thankful so that we may show forth your praise not only with our lips but in our lives and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. We stand now to sing the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, after which Paul will bring us our scripture readings. Two verses 1 to 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk together in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the second reading is from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day and hour... No one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they know nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, One will be taken, and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thank you very much, Paul. So, good morning. Thank you to everybody who made yesterday's wonderful Christmas fair so special. I think we're all quite tired, is that right? <laughs> but a lot of people have said to me how much you enjoyed it, and that's really important that we enjoy it. Also very aware that um, one or two people who were stall holders were saying how many people they spoke to came because a flyer was delivered through their door. So a big thank you to that mammoth effort of letting people know this was on yesterday and for inviting them. Our Christmas fair incidentally marks the beginning of our Advent season, as does lighting our candle here the waiting for the coming of Jesus. I'm going to be speaking largely on Isaiah Isaiah chapter 2, but just want to refer to what Matthew says to us in this short reading that's appointed for today, that he is really, through these verses, reinforcing the idea that we as a community must be ready for Jesus. And being ready is to continue to do everything that Jesus had taught that Matthew has written about. So Matthew is pinpointing this urgency for us to be ready because of everything that we've learnt within his writings about Jesus. We need to be living out that life that Jesus taught. And so that we spend the days living as witnesses to Jesus, as he instructed. And in that sense, the season of Advent is our annual reminder of the importance of faithfully doing what Jesus um, has asked us to do. Jesus calls the disciples, he calls you and me, and empowers us to witness faithfully to God's ultimate purposes, which are of love, peace, joy, and abundance, as the illustrations show. This comes with great clarity in Matthew's writing and is a powerful way for us to think our lives through during Advent. And yet, as we do think through our lives, we can't avoid seeing and being aware of things that are going on around us and perhaps actually affect us, some of us, directly. Interestingly, the World Cup seems to have raised all kinds of voices in relation to justice in Qatar or Saudi Arabia, for human rights and for justice issues to be, uh, to be acknowledged. The war continuing in Ukraine is in its 10th, 11th month now. Months of destruction, destruction of lives and the horror of what people have had to live through and endure as their cities and homes have been destroyed. And the fears that the rest of the world who are part of NATO have felt in that that war possibly igniting uh, 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 NATO's involvement. In addition, we have seen on the news the horrors of landslides, of floods, of volcanic activity, of earthquakes the pains that this planet is going through and our attitude towards it as a home for us all to dwell in safety and for animal life to thrive as well, gives us a really strong element of our Advent thinking as our responsibility of a witness to Christ that we care for this earth. So these verses in Isaiah seem very pertinent for this first Sunday in Advent. In fact, verse 4, part of verse 4 itself, which says this, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Those words are etched in stone in front of the United Nations building in New York. But those words may seem a little bit empty right now. And in this rather, what may look like to some, a hopelessly hostile word, we do need to hear again God's promise of peace with justice, that hope that this light of this candle emulates. In Advent, we look forward to the coming of the Prince of Peace, 
Of course, Jesus has already come, we know that. And he has brought peace to many people individually and into communities. As Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, he has come and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility that separated Jew from non-Jew, from Gentile. But I think you will agree with me, there is still much peacemaking to do. And that to be done before he comes again, so that disputes are settled with justice and with mercy. And in a war-weary world, which can be filled with cynicism and with despair, we have the opportunity this Sunday and every day of our lives to hold up this extraordinary promise of peace that comes through Isaiah's words today. He begins with the assurance of what follows is a divine revelation. What what Isaiah saw was a vision, and a vision that emulated the word of God. This is not just one man's hope, Isaiah's hope against hope in a disintegrating world around him. This is the sure promise of the one true God who rules the world. And what Isaiah saw was a mountain, the mountain of the Lord's temple, established as chief among the mountains, raised above the hills. And this is a reference to Mount Zion, on which the old city that we know today, and therefore the temple, was built. And therefore the place where God dwelt in Israel's history. It's hard for us to imagine that, a place, a physical place, where God dwelt a place of worship. If you've ever traveled to Jerusalem, there is an old road. There's a modern, very good uh, motorway, freeway up to Jerusalem now, but the old road was called the Burma Road. And there comes a point as you're traveling through the hills, going through the forests, up and down, taking turns on a little bit like hairpin bends, going up one side of a mountain down to another, where you suddenly see Jerusalem in the distance. And it is surrounded by hills. There's no, we would call them hills, they are called mountains in, uh, in Isaiah's prophecy. And uh, there's a wonderful verse in the Psalms that talks about God surrounding his people as the hills surround Jerusalem, completely embraced, encompassed. That's the image as you draw near to Jerusalem. And that's the mountain of the Lord, the specific place where he dwelt, that's going to be raised up. Some Christians take this prophecy of Isaiah um, as something that will happen literally. There have been many prophecies from the Old Testament that we have seen literally fulfilled. It's a position that many Christians take today, that this will be fulfilled towards the end of time. Other Christians believe that this prophecy has been already spiritually fulfilled, that this temple that Isaiah is talking about, this temple is in fact the church. And as the church preaches the gospel to all nations, they stream to be part of that church themselves. You can see that that is a good image for something that has been the nature and the mark of the Christian church preaching the gospel. Other Christians think this prophecy has been fulfilled by Christ himself who claimed to be the new temple that would be destroyed and rebuilt in three days. That is recorded by Matthew himself. Jesus was the person, not the place, in whom God dwelt in grace and truth. And it's important to note that Matthew's gospel shows us Jesus teaching on a mountain at the beginning of his ministry, sending his disciples out into all the world, and he himself ascended from the Mount of Olives. I don't know how you wish to interpret Isaiah, but in whatever way we may take this image of a mountain being raised up, all the all nations part is really quite remarkable. Isaiah, as an entirety of a book, is filled with all kinds of pronouncements of judgments on all the nations around Israel. 
not because God's nature is judgmental, but because he is calling them to God's ways, to repent and to turn away. But here in this passage, the people from every nation invite each other to join the pilgrim, pilgrimage to the place where the God of Israel dwells. An extraordinary image of all nations coming together, coming with one another, inviting others to come to the place of God's dwelling. And they come to Mount Zion, we might expect to worship, and of course that is part of what will be understood of what happened in the temple. But specifically here, Isaiah shows us that they come to be instructed, to be taught and not just to gain knowledge, knowledge of God that is given to Israel, but actually to walk in his paths, to become part of his demonstration of love on this earth. The law that God had given to Israel as a special blessing on his redeemed people will now go out from Zion. What good news the law will go out to the world and shape the life of the nations. Now, it's interesting, that phrase, because many Christians um, would celebrate our freedom from the law. And that, I think, is partly because we have an image of the law as being cited in order to bring judgment on other believers who live their lives maybe slightly differently. And they need, we think, to... Uh, attend to what the Old Testament law says. We're quick, we can be in some parts of the church, very quick to cite God's law. However, for the Jews of the time, on the other hand, the law was God's gift. It was a sign of God's special covenant relationship with them. These instructions that came from him, these divine instructions, helped to forge a national identity. This is what we look like as a people. This is how God wants us to live. This points to God's character and his love. The law reminded people too, the Jewish people, that the God who parted the Red Sea and conquered Pharaoh's armies was sticking around with them for the long haul. He wasn't going to abandon them. This is not a God who liberates and then abandons. Deliverance, therefore, is not just for one time. God is with us to deliver again and again and again. In this sense, the law offered a sense of stability and moral purpose. Now, says Isaiah in chapter 2, God's law will one day bring the same sense of identity and stability and moral purpose to all the world. All will be the beneficiaries of God's good rules that structure life so that all of humanity, all of creation can flourish. And when a sense of rights trampled and wrongs that have been done threaten to divide a nation from nation, as has happened right throughout history, God will be the one who judges between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. God promises that when God's law is the law of the nations, God himself will judge the squabbles between nations and people. As a result of divine justice, there, sorry, as a, as a, as a result of this divine justice, there will be peace. Nation will transform their weapons of destruction into instruments of flourishing. They will go from being weapons that kill to tools that dig and garden and care for that which is grown to feed and to delight. Because of God's reign and his law's fair rules, there will be no need to fight there won't be any training for war. There'll be no armies or navy or air force. There'll be no SAS training. Instead, people will live together in peace over all the world. It's a wonderful picture. How can that happen? It can't happen through our hands. 
Humans can't make it happen. And that's the point of the prophecy here. Only God can do this. Only when his mountain is raised up, when his light, when his law is dominant, is obvious, and is clearly seen, will all people stream to it. And everyone lives by God's law, and God brings peace with justice. Only then, when God brings peace with justice, can there be peace on earth which is exactly what the angels sang when the baby Jesus was born. That's exactly why when that baby who grew up died on the cross to make peace through his blood, breaking down the dividing wall of hostility. And that's exactly what the new heavens and the new earth will be like when nations walk by the light of the Lamb, to quote Revelation chapter 1. In the meantime, that's what verse 5 of our text is about. After announcing the coming peace, God exhorts his people to walk in the light of the vision. Come, O house of Judah, let us walk in the light of the Lord. As you live through your war-torn times, live in the light of God's promised peace, is what he is saying. Here is a call for you and I, this new advent, to live by faith. We can't see the peace that God, of God ruling among the nations, or even, dare I say, in our church worldwide. We are tempted to complain or despair, but God calls us to live by his light, not by this present darkness. It is easy to become cynical and depressed belligerent or beaten down. But God calls us to faith in his soaring promise of peace and become peacemakers wherever and however we can. I have found extraordinary moments in my life as I look back where very young children have been peacemakers. Peacemakers amongst adults. It is possible for us as adults to be peacemakers too, but it's been so striking when you see it in the hearts of little ones to bring about peace in a very little way, but in a very pertinent way in their families or amongst friends. We cannot bring God's peace himself, but we can demonstrate it in our own lives, and there's a difference. By being at peace with one another, we are demonstrating it. The peace of God that's described here in Isaiah is where all nations come together in unity. And therefore, we should be praying for our leaders to be working for that. And indeed, we do pray. It was from a mountaintop that Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. In Advent, this new season, this text from Isaiah chapter 2, illuminates that our Advent candle for hope and peace has great meaning for us today. Let's just pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your life and your instruction to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Isaiah through whom you spoke to call us to a peace that comes from you. Lord, may we know your peace. Shine in our hearts where there is hurt or pain. Bring your healing so that we may truly hold your light, your light of hope, and be your peacemakers just where we are. And we pray for your coming. Come quickly, Lord Jesus to bring peace on earth as you have promised. Amen. Shall we stand to say the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sit or kneel as Pat comes to lead our intercessions. Almighty God, as the new day dawns on this Advent Sunday, we give thanks for the first glimmers of the light which reminds us of the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. We believe that your light has the power to overcome all darkness and pray that throughout the season of Advent we may share in the mystery of your coming into the world. Please hear us as we pray in faith for the needs of the church and the world and thank you for your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We've been asked by the Archbishops of Canterbury and York to continue to pray for the people of Ukraine as they face the winter under increased missile attacks, specifically targeting the infrastructure serving the civilian population. We pray for the innocent, the women, men and children who are displaced, whose lives are disrupted and who live in fear of the atrocities of war. Pray for those with power that they may take a resolute and public decision never to use force, to actively work for peace and seek peaceful solutions to dispute and agreement, a disagreement. Pray that there may be a recognition of common and shared humanity and God's promise of flourishing life for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we thank you for all of creation which you have made for us to enjoy, whether in our gardens, in city parks, the seaside, mountains, rivers and lakes. We thank you for the sights and sounds of nature and the healing it brings to troubled minds. But we're also mindful that there are many places in the world suffering the effects of the destruction of your creation, resulting in floods, fires, droughts and hurricanes. We pray that we may all show respect for the earth and be willing to be involved in conservation and caring for the planet. May all those with influence earnestly seek ways to deal effectively with global warming and plan for the future, for the generations to come. Loving Father, govern the hearts and minds of all world leaders and those in authority that they may act justly, honestly and according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Father, we pray for King Charles and the Queen Consort as they <coughs> take up their new duties. We also pray for um, their government, that those in positions of power listen to the voices of justice and reason and act in good faith for the good of society. We pray for our local community leaders in Croydon as they tackle the problems of homelessness and violence. We bring before you the emergency services, the medical and care professionals, and all those who continue to work in those vital frontline services on which we all depend. At this time of recession and financial anxiety, strengthen those you have called to speak out, who challenge injustice, apathy, and untruth and who campaign for the well-being of your people and your world. Father, we pray for our church family, for our church leaders and all who give unsparingly of their time and efforts to ensure that the ministry continues. We pray especially for this year's Christmas preparations, for those taking part in the Christmas journey, carols by candlelight and the crib service. Loving Father, we bring before you this morning the children and young people of our parish as they cope with the influences and demands of school or university or work. 
May they know real love and security in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick or struggling at this time, whether in body, mind or spirit, for the exhausted, the weary, for those who can no longer cope on their own. Bless with hope those who are unemployed, homeless, deserted or friendless. Give your deep healing to the sick, the disturbed, the damaged and the lost. We take time now to think of those whom we know to be in need of your comforting presence, for those named in the notice sheet. As we have named them in our hearts, so let them feel your presence and friendship in their lives as we take a moment in silence to commit them to your loving care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, during this season of Advent, as we move towards the festivities of Christmas, we pray that peace will flow from all of our actions and interactions this week. We ask you to help us to make this your house a welcoming place to all who come here, and that your love will be evident to those entering our doors. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue in prayer as we say the collect for today together. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day, when we shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing our last hymn now, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe, during which the collection will be taken.
Would you like to be seated for a moment? I <coughs> just want to reiterate again um, what I said earlier on, that we had a wonderful time yesterday at the fair. I want to say a very particular thank you to Sue and Sue for, first of all, instigating it. It's one of those typical moments you get when somebody suggests something and then the vicar says, well, would you like to do it? And normally they say no. But in this case, they said, yes. <laughs> I know a lot of people have done a lot of work as well. But were it not for your um, suggestion that we re revise, we um, reinstate the Christmas fair and your hard work overseeing it, it wouldn't have happened. So let's show our appreciation to Sue and Sue. There will be a final uh, counting. I think Jenny's going to be doing that of all the pennies. It's not, not often we see that much cash around these days, is it? But of, of the takings from the stalls and from the refreshments and so on, and we'll let you know what, uh, what the fair made. But what was important, I think, was the community that came together. It was lovely. And there's plenty more opportunities for that in the month ahead with different services taking place in church. And then we're going to also have carols around the Christmas tree outside, which we have done for the last two or three years, which has always been really popular with people living in the roads around. Now, some of the invitations have been printed off. A lot more are going to be uh, printed off for delivery. We really would great if we could deliver as much as we did for the Christmas fair. And so there are some, I think there's about 10, not eight or 10 mm -hmm. packs just at the back that are ready to go. If you wouldn't mind delivering this week, that would be great. The first Christmas um, service event we will have will be Chris Dingle on December the 11th. So it's really helpful to try to deliver all of our invitations before that date. So that's why I'm urging you to do some this week and then we'll have more to do next week. But as I say, they're on the back pew there just in front of Andrew, who's on the camera. And any of you who are watching online, if you'd like to help with delivery, just give Jennifer a ring in the office and we can arrange for you to pick up the leaflets for a road that you're willing to deliver for. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's become obviously apparent as the days have got darker that our lighting is almost completely insufficient. So I just wanted to update you on that. It's also clear, I know, to many of us that our sound system um, has almost died a death as well. And as you know, we're using some of the legacy money to put in place a new sound system, which we've decided should not be in place by Christmas because it'll be too new. And who knows what <laughs> what position we'll be in to be able to operate it fully. So it'll be in place during January. We will then turn our attention back to the lighting and getting the right setup for us in place for the following year. And we will be looking to fundraise for that. It would be lovely if there were any members online or here um, or anybody who watches this later in the week who has uh, some desire or inkling that they could give a hand with fundraising, trying to find grants that would support our um, proposals and fundraising from within the church family and beyond. So we haven't forgotten about the lighting. Uh, we just need to do one thing at a time um, so that we're not overdoing it and doing the, um, the toilets and the refurbishment of the corridors of the Magdalene Centre was we found running that project alongside trying to get the lighting project off the ground was just too much. And so we put the lighting project on hold and then, of course, our sound system failed and the PCC came to the conclusion uh, we do need to be able to be heard clearly and we should get this sorted as soon as possible. So more on that in the new year. Thank you. May God the Father, judge all merciful, make us worthy of a place in his kingdom. Amen. May God the Son, coming among us in power, reveal in our midst the promise of his glory. Amen. May God the Holy Spirit, make us steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. As we await our coming Saviour, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.